You are now unmuted. Again, hold on. Jó, én megnyitottam magamnak a YouTube channel is lehalkítva, tehát ott is fogom látni, hogyha valami történik. Aha. Jó, ott a hangot nyilván kikapcsoltam, majd remélem nem lesz zavaró a késés. Meglátjuk, hogy működik. Rendben. You are now muted. So welcome everybody. I think uh, I'm live now. Uh, this is the first presentation uh, in this summer school and uh, the title is Data Processing and Data Management Activities at Eli Apps. Uh, my name is Laura Stratner. I'm a software engineer at Eli Apps and uh, as this is an introductory talk, I, I won't give you uh, too much details, too much technical information. I would like to give you an overview about Eli Apps and uh, data processing and data management activities uh, here. Um, also a few facts about uh, what is Eli Apps, what we are doing, um, and uh, how, we manage, uh, how we try to manage the, these uh, activities that are uh, ahead of us. Um, I was told that you can uh, make comments uh, to the presentation, so I, I will be listening. And if there are any comments, please uh, uh, share with me, and I'll try to reflect uh, on the comments. Um, hopefully you can see my presentation. I will uh, make it full screen now, and then uh, we can start. Okay, so uh, first, a short overview of the presentation. Um, this is not exactly how I see on, on my screen, but uh, I hope you can see it. Uh, so this is a short overview uh, of my talk. Uh, first, I will talk about Eli Apps itself. Um, who are we? What is our mission? and what kind of research infrastructure we are building and we will be operating. And then after we uh, uh, overview uh, this, we can see uh, the data collection activities, uh, how we plan to uh, collect the data, what kind of data we are planning to uh, collect, 
uh, how we are planning to process uh, and store it, and what kind of uh, further uh, activities are forcing uh, in the near future. Uh, so first, a uh, few things about Eli and Eli Hubs. Um, Hopefully it will uh, appear soon. Uh, yes, so ELI is uh, short for extreme light infrastructure. Uh, we are in fact three facilities uh, being uh, built in three different countries. And there is an umbrella organization which oversees the construction of these facilities. One facility is in the Czech Republic near Prague. It is called ELI Beam Lines. Uh, Another one uh, is in is in construction in Szeged, Hungary. This is Eli Alps. I will talk uh, more about this later. And the third one is Eli MP uh, in Magurele, Roman Romania. Uh, these uh, facilities are in nearly the same phase of construction, um, but they all, they all uh, proceed at their own pace and uh, will. Uh, give their uh, services to the uh, user community at a later stage. Uh, ELIDC is, as I said, is an umbrella organization that uh, covers uh, the, uh, these uh, facilities and uh, there will be a, a joint uh, uh, management uh, which, uh, which is uh, set and uh, then uh, beam time and, and administrative matters will be handled by this. The main uh, aim of these facilities is uh, to construct and uh, operate uh, intense laser sources uh, for inter interdisciplinary research. And uh, the, the main focus of the research is uh, uh, light uh, and matter interaction. Uh, you can visit our uh, uh, page. Uh, there is a homepage for the deliverable con uh, consortium, uh, elilaser.eu, and also, of course, there are uh, web pages at, at the uh, individual facilities as well. Uh, I will show you some of these uh, later. Uh, so, one of the facilities is Eliabs. You will be, uh, you can see our nice building in a moment. Uh, so this is uh, an area view of our, our building. In fact, uh, if you uh, take a look uh, behind me, you can see part of the building. Uh, I try to position myself so you, so you can see. Um, a few words about the building and uh, then we will uh, approach the uh, research infrastructure from there. So, uh, the main technological building is in, in the back. It is a gray uh, square uh, building, and we will see the details uh, of this. Other parts of the building uh, uh, complex is uh, office uh, spaces, uh, a conference hall, uh, some uh, utility uh, building, and laboratories for the scientists and we have uh, storage areas and, and uh, uh, external uh, facilities uh, at, at the back. Uh, the building is located just outside the city. It's a very nice building and a very nice working environment. Uh, but what uh, concerns us more, most now is the technological building. So I, I will uh, talk about this uh, uh, later in, in some detail. You can visit our web page, of course. It is eliabs.hu. Uh, you can uh, go to the uh, uh, homepage or, or straight to the gallery and, and see some more uh, nice photos from uh, outside and inside the, the topic as well. So, uh, what is the mission here? Uh, so there is some specialty at each of the uh, individual facilities. Our specialty is uh, uh, to generate very short laser passes. This is in the femtosecond and attosecond range. Uh, as I told you, I'm not a physicist, 
Uh, I'm a software engineer, uh, so I'm not the best person to uh, give you details about the, uh, this um, laser science, but I, I will try to highlight some of the most inter interesting things about uh, what is the uh, uh, main characteristics of, of these lasers, and then we, we can go on and continue with data processing. Uh, so implementation of this facility, of course, poses many challenges. Uh, I will concentrate on the IT side of these challenges, uh, the IT infrastructure. So we have, uh, have to have a very special data network, storage uh, capacity, computing capabilities. Uh, we need to develop our uh, custom control system software so that all these uh, equipment will be uh, we will be able to operate them and of course uh, the main topic of this talk and, and the whole summer school is data processing and data management um, so a few words about these uh, um, short laser passes so the the alps part in eli alps is up to second light pass source okay uh, up the second uh, is uh, there to characterize the length of the pass. Uh, interestingly enough, it's not uh, usually it's not given uh, in some sort of uh, length, but uh, they characterize it with uh, with uh, time. Uh, and our uh, research technology is is built uh, by this scheme. We have primary laser sources which produce uh, uh, so-called long passes, which are, of course, not, not that long, but uh, compared to the ones we would like to generate, they are long. Uh, they are in the femtosecond range. Uh, and uh, we have a beam transport uh, uh, part, which are mainly uh, vacuum chambers and vacuum tubes, where these uh, uh, passes are propagated to secondary sources and uh, the secondary sources are where the uh, magic happens. Uh, they generate short passes, uh, and uh, these passes will be uh, again uh, delivered to end stations where uh, measurements and experiments will happen. Uh, these short passes uh, will give the possibility of uh, studying uh, light and matter interaction uh, as you could see uh, earlier, there is a, a fine temporal resolution which can be achieved by these short passes. So very short uh, processes can be studied inside uh, very tiny uh, places of uh, matter. Uh, just to give you uh, an idea of uh, what kind of time scale we are uh, talking about, it was very interesting to me when I first uh, met with this comparison. So one at the second is uh, 10 to the minus 18th second. Uh, this is, uh, well, you can see it's quite short, but uh, if we put this into perspective, uh, uh, 10 to the 18th second is uh, approximately uh, 31 billion years, which is comparable to the age of the universe. So uh, why I bring this up is that uh, uh, if you try to imagine what kind of uh, uh, duration one at the second is, you can you can feel that uh, the the scale of things is uh, that one at the second. Uh, if you compare it to a second, it feels like one second uh, compared to the time that elapsed from Big Bang. So it is a very short uh, time duration, and this is the time scale we are uh, we are talking about. Things happen very fast, uh, and of course, things happen at, at tiny, uh, uh, very confined spaces of matter. Uh, these passes are generated uh, at some frequency, uh, typically from 10 hertz to 100 kilohertz uh, at our lasers. And, and this gives the uh, researchers the, the opportunity to gather data, accumulate data, and then process the, them later. Uh, OK, uh, if we go further, so you could see uh, this uh, image and the technological building. Uh, and 
And if we uh, remove the cover of this technological building, we could see something like this uh, here in the in the top left corner. Uh, the uh, area is divided into roughly uh, four uh, uh, segments. One segment is the laser area, okay, where the primary laser sources are located. We will have uh, six of these, uh, which uh, have um, more or less cryptic names, HR1 and 2. This is high repetition rate laser with 100 kilohertz. MIR is the MIR infrared laser, uh, which produces light uh, in, in this uh, uh, part of the spectrum. Silos is a uh, single cycle. Uh, <clears throat> We have two of these, and the high field petawatt will produce very, very powerful uh, light classes. Now, uh, things are a little bit more complicated when we uh, see it in reality. Uh, beam transport is very hard to delineate in, in this figure. It's comprised of vacuum uh, tubes and vacuum chambers, but laser passes are delivered to these so-called uh, secondary source uh, areas. And uh, you can see the lower left corner where we have most of the equipment uh, uh, already assembled. And the, the top part are uh, under heavy development. Uh, these areas are surrounded by uh, one meter concrete, uh, one meter thick concrete wall on the left side and two meters uh, thick concrete wall on the right side uh, because uh, some uh, uh, dangerous uh, radiation will be generated there, and uh, it, uh, it's necessary to, to have a uh, 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 safe working environment uh, for people who are working here. Nobody will be allowed to be present inside these areas when the experiments will be carried out. They have to go outside. It is not that dangerous uh, here where the, uh, um, we don't need that kind of shielding. Okay, uh, now what kind of uh, uh, special arrangements are needed? Uh, uh, it, you can see it on the next slide. Uh, the uh, construction of this uh, building is special. It is built on, the vibra on a vibration-free base because vibration causes uh, disturbances in light propagation and uh, that uh, should be uh, avoided. Uh, uh, the laboratories are a very much regulated environment. There are vacuum chambers, vacuum tubing, because all the, uh, nearly all light propagation has to happen in a uh, high vacuum, which means uh, nearly empty space uh, is needed to propagate these kind of uh, passes. Uh, and the, uh, the lasers and the other equipment uh, need a very stable environment. So we have clean rooms where uh, uh, temperature and uh, humidity and, and so on, these kind of parameters are uh, strictly regulated. We have, of course, uh, strict uh, safety measures, so uh, uh, special uh, protective uh, equipment is needed when uh, personnel enter the labs. Uh, Google's, as you can see, uh, clothes and, uh, and other equipment uh, is, is needed. Uh, I can share a few photos with you about how things look like when, when uh, you enter. These are uh, live, uh, taken from live camera uh, streams. Uh, the top left uh, is one of our uh, primary laser sources, uh, it's silos. Uh, um, all labs nearly look the same from a, from a distance, uh, so these boxes uh, cover the uh, uh, mirrors and other equipment that are used to produce these kind of uh, laser passes. Uh, the other uh, laser area on, on the right side is the high field petawatt laser, which is uh, under construction. This is uh, uh, just some boxes uh, waiting to be placed at the right places. 
inside the laboratory. Uh, on the lower side, we have the uh, secondary source area. Uh, we have one of the Anson equipment here. Uh, it looks like some uh, randomly placed uh, tubes. Uh, and um, But I can assure you that this is something which was de de deliberately uh, designed and, and placed here uh, uh, the, the way it, it was. So this is a serious uh, measurement uh, device called NanoEsca. And uh, at, the, at the other side, uh, again, you can see vacuum chambers and vacuum tubes. Uh, laser passes uh, enter the area from uh, uh, the lower part and then propagate towards the uh, upper part. Uh, these uh, black uh, covers are uh, laser shields so that if some radiation uh, leakage uh, happens, then the, the person working in the lab uh, uh, is not in danger. Um, so uh, now that we can uh, see the background and know what our uh, research uh, technology looks like, we can speak about data collection and, and data uh, processing, data management. Uh, to see the big picture, uh, we need to see uh, what kind of activity is, uh, is uh, planned uh, at our facility. So we uh, expect that user will uh, submit proposals uh, for us for uh, conducting experiments. These will be evaluated and uh, if the uh, scientific board uh, approves them, then the uh, preparation and the experiment can go on. Now, preparation means, uh, from a data collection point of view, means that some simulations will be carried out, uh, preliminary data and parameters will be determined uh, for the experiment. Then uh, the experiment itself will be carried out uh, and measurements will be uh, uh, carried out. Uh, sensors, cameras, uh, and uh, other uh, data will be collected. I will talk about this later a little bit in more detail. Uh, this will last approximately a few weeks. Uh, then uh, when the data is collected, then uh, the next phase is analysis, where the uh, collected data is analyzed and uh, the uh, scientists will, de will determine whether uh, they found something interesting and uh, which is worthy of publication. Hopefully this will be the case. Uh, the main um, point here is that uh, by data collection, uh, uh, it is usually uh, the case that people only mean uh, data collected from experiments, which, uh, which is so-called raw, da raw data. And uh, what I would like to emphasize is that raw, da raw data is not enough. We need all these kinds of uh, data. We need to be aware that uh, these phases uh, are present and uh, we need to prepare uh, for the possibility that uh, all these data will be collected and uh, later will be present when someone wants to uh, uh, maybe uh, repeat the experiment or, uh, or uh, verify the vali val uh, validity of, of the experiment. Uh, what types of data we plan to collect? Uh, of course, there are plain documents. Uh, which are uh, which are related to the investigation. Um, we need to think about uh, doc files and text files, and maybe presentations. So this is these are the proposal uh, related research published papers from uh, similar uh, investigations, uh, simulation descriptions and results. Uh, a multitude of tools are available for uh, simulation. So. We need to be able to uh, accommodate these, uh, store the descriptions and the results uh, in the data set that is collected uh, for the uh, particular investigation. Then, of course, the most interesting part 
uh, is measurement uh, during the experiment. These uh, include uh, sensor data and, and data from the end station and, and uh, uh, experimental devices, for example, voltages, histograms, images taken by cameras. This is uh, very, very often the case in, in, at Eli Apps. We will have a lot of images and of course they, uh, they can take up considerable space and we need to store them. Uh, scientists uh, increasingly uh, use logbooks and electronic logbooks instead of uh, paper-based logbooks. And uh, we created uh, an electronic logbooks uh, service for them here at Eli Apps. This is in fact uh, of the um, of the experiment and uh, these uh, these uh, data uh, also will be stored alongside of the of the rest. Uh, logbook entries are uh, put there by the scientists themselves. Uh, manually, they can include text, images, anything they want that is related to the experiment. Uh, a very important part of uh, uh, data is uh, the so-called environment data, which means the environment of the experiment. Uh, as I told you, uh, there is a very special uh, laboratory environment with uh, vibration uh, sensors, uh, pressure gauges, um, temperature uh, sensors and so on and we need to uh, measure and record all these data so that the uh, experiment can be uh, interpreted and maybe uh, repeated later. Okay and then of course uh, analysis, descriptions and results, charts, calculations and of course if there are uh, any publications uh, as a result of the experiment then these can be at least linked to this uh, collection of data. So the main aim, and this will be uh, repeated over and over, uh, is verifiability of the experiment and reproducibility of the experiment. We uh, need as much data as possible so that the, uh, these aims uh, can be fulfilled. Um, a few details about what kind of environmental data we collect, because this is very specific to Eli Apps. Um, you can see the, uh, the technological building uh, layout again. And uh, on the left, uh, I listed uh, some of the environmental data that we collect alongside with the uh, Raw data. These sometimes these uh, kind of data are also called metadata because uh, um, they are distinguished from the from the sensor data and, and the raw data that is collected during the experiment. So what we are uh, collecting, we collect uh, pass characteristic data. So what kind of uh, passes uh, the primary sources and the secondary sources are providing. Uh, of course, duration, stability, uh, power, average power, peak power, and uh, these kind of uh, characteristics from the uh, laser passes themselves. Uh, we try to produce uh, very stable um, characteristics for these passes, but of course there is a slight variation. Uh, it, this is, cannot be avoided, so it's important that we know uh, how much uh, uh, deviation or, or uh, uh, differences uh, there from the uh, specifications, if there are any. Uh, as I told you, vibration uh, can affect the experiment very much. So we, uh, we have um, dozens of vibration sensors uh, uh, placed into the uh, floor of the building and we uh, collect these vibration sensor data continuously and we can uh, attach these data to the uh, experimental data so later analysis can take into account these uh, vibrations if there were any any unusual activity uh, during the experiment then that can uh, uh, can uh, uh, 
say something about uh, whether the uh, measurement was uh, what, what kind of uh, effects it has on the on the measurements uh, themselves. Uh, as I told you, uh, uh, light propagation is done in inside vacuum, so we have uh, quite a number of uh, vacuum chambers, vacuum tubes, all kinds of vacuum uh, equipment which uh, uh, we need to produce uh, these uh, vacuums. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we measure the pressure or uh, maybe a lack of it because uh, there is nothing in these chambers. So uh, there is no, uh, if everything goes well, then there is no pressure in the, in the chambers or very low pressure. Uh, it is so-called high vacuum, which, which is being produced uh, there. We have uh, several technological ga gases which uh, take part in the uh, um, laser plus production, uh, helium, uh, uh, hydrogen, and, and so other other gases. And of course, the, the pressure of these gases uh, is also important. Uh, the uh, laboratory environment is controlled. And uh, this, uh, the stability of this laboratory environment is very important for the safe operation of, of the uh, laser and the predictable operation of the uh, lasers. So we collect temperature data, uh, air humidity, uh, particle counts, how, how many uh, dust particles are in, in the air, uh, very little, of course and uh, relative pressure because uh, we maintain uh, over pressure in the in the laboratories so uh, air uh, goes from the laboratories uh, to the outside so this is uh, uh, this ensures that uh, no contamination or no dust can uh, enter the uh, laboratories when someone uh, leaves the room or, or enters the room um, on the uh, bottom part, there is a live visualization of all these environmental data which we collect. Uh, this is uh, uh, a service provided for our uh, internal staff and also for the uh, users, so they can monitor these uh, environmental uh, characteristics and immediately see if uh, there is uh, something uh, which is uh, not uh, according to the specifications. Uh, there are several of these dashboards. Um, there is one for each laboratory. And uh, if there is a unique combination of uh, parameters which they would like to monitor, then we can uh, create the one for them. And then they can monitor the uh, parameters uh, which they are interested in. This is very popular and already uh, uh, operating for a few years. Uh, not everything which I'm talking about is ready yet. This is a work in progress and uh, data collection and data management is uh, uh, also work in progress. And uh, it's like a puzzle. We are uh, putting pieces in place and this is a, a uh, summary uh, slide of what I was talking about so far. So we have the phases of the experiment, uh, initiation, preparation, experiment itself, analysis, dissemination, which uh, also can mean uh, a publication, of course. And uh, the uh, this happy face on the bottom is the uh, user or uh, experimenter who, uh, of course, uh, uh, produces uh, directly or indirectly this kind of data. Uh, and uh, then we are required to uh, put in place a catalog which uh, contains uh, all these kinds of data which are accumulated during uh, an experiment or an investigation uh, from initiation through simulation and uh, environment data and uh, sensor data uh, up until the uh, uh, publication. Uh, 
And then hopefully there will be happy users who will use this. Uh, this is uh, this catalog is a searchable catalog. And uh, if uh, it, it works like a, a search engine, um, if, we, if they put in some search terms, then a, a list of, list of uh, hits will be uh, provided for them and then they can select uh, what they are interested in and hopefully can uh, access uh, all the uh, data which is relevant to the particle investigation. This happens, of course, after uh, an embargo period, uh, which is typically uh, a few years, two or three years. Uh, uh, during that uh, yeah, embargo period, only the uh, experimental team can use the data. And when the em embargo period is over, then it will be <clears throat> uh, open up and uh, other researchers can benefit from the results of, of these kind of investigations. Uh, not, as I said, not every piece of this puzzle is in place yet. We are building this system uh, piece by piece, uh, but this is the big picture we see uh, ahead of us, and this is uh, where we are going. Um, now, a few details about what we have on site. Uh, only a few uh, things. So we have two petabytes of storage disk uh, space available. Uh, we think that this will be enough for at least two or three years to come. Uh, so data is not accumulating in, in a pace that uh, we, we think this will, we, this will fill up. Uh, uh, if there will be uh, a need for, for an extra storage space, then of course this will be uh, extended either on site or we will uh, make arrangements uh, so that this will be available in the cloud somewhere for the researchers. Uh, we have one HPC, a high performance computing cluster, which contains very powerful CPUs and GPUs for scientific batch computation. Um, our scientists uh, like this very much. They, they use it to their full capacity. Uh, to be honest, uh, there is not enough capacity uh, uh, in the world for, uh, for the scientists. They can adjust the parameters very quickly so that uh, they fill up the uh, available um, resources. Um, but uh, it's important that we have some kind of uh, computing uh, capability, computing uh, 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 resources uh, on site so that they can uh, run their simulations and analyze their results. Uh, also, there are some kinds of uh, computations and, and use cases which re require interactive uh, use. Uh, these uh, include um, very popular uh, scientific applications like MATLAB and COMSOL and so on. So we have uh, a plan and we are uh, near completion of uh, uh, interactive server uh, uh, HPC, uh, which they can use uh, then from their own offices via remote connection and they can use it interactively. Uh, there is one particular application which I would like to uh, draw your attention to. Uh, I don't know how much uh, uh, how much you know about uh, these uh, so-called Jupyter notebooks, but uh, it's uh, it seems to be an emerging technology which is uh, uh, already very popular among our uh, scientists. These Jupyter notebooks uh, are uh, an interesting mixture, mixture of uh, code, so executable code, Python, for example, equations, visualizations, and, uh, and text, which is a description of the um, experiment or the analysis they are uh, uh, carrying out. And uh, this is also interactive, so these notebooks can be created so that if you uh, change, a parameter 
or change uh, an equation, then uh, almost immediately uh, the uh, results reflect the change uh, so that uh, uh, these kind of uh, uh, notebooks can be used for ex uh, exploring uh, what kind of uh, results can be derived from the data the, the scientists uh, have. So this is becoming uh, very popular and uh, I think it is uh, worth a look. And if you, are, if you haven't met with this kind of technology, then I uh, very much encourage you to check it out and see whether it fits, your, uh, uh, fits you and uh, you can use it for your own purposes. Uh, chances are that you can. Uh, we are also popularizing it among our scientists, so more and more uh, of our uh, internal staff and users can do it. We, are, we make it sure that we put the uh, resources behind it, because of course these kind of computations can be uh, very, uh, uh, very costly, and we, we need a lot of uh, computing power behind it, but uh, if it's there, then, the, uh, then we can uh, have these kind of interactive notebooks and very nice results can be, can be derived from it. Uh, okay, uh, I'm near the end of my presentation. Uh, I think we have a few minutes left. What I would like to also talk about, it, it's a little bit uh, uh, further away in, in the uh, future, but it is something we are uh, going towards and we see on the horizon. And I would like to go back to the topic of uh, verifiability and uh, reproducibility of the uh, experiments or the investigations. And this is a, a common theme, which is, uh, uh, um, which is uh, recognized not only by us, but by the interna International Research Committee. And uh, what these kind of uh, uh, concepts uh, resulted in is these uh, so-called FAIR data principles. Uh, FAIR is an acronym uh, which is uh, constructed from these uh, four words, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And these are the uh, uh, goals that uh, we, we should have in mind when we uh, conduct uh, research and uh, conduct uh, investigations. And this is... Uh, uh, something which encompasses uh, the goals that we uh, should uh, aim for when we uh, collect data as well. So what these terms mean, a uh, little bit in more detail, uh, findable means that the data uh, needs to be findable. Uh, if I look for uh, some kind of uh, experiment uh, from the past, then uh, I should be able to find it for this. Uh, there are some requirements, for example, there should be uh, unique IDs assigned to uh, specific parts of the investigations, uh, even to, uh, to pieces of research equipment which uh, were, were used uh, during the investigation. And also, uh, we need to uh, provide rich metadata for the, uh, for the investigation. This is the same thing I, I was talking about when uh, when uh, it was uh, on, on a slide. Uh, I put it on a slide that uh, raw data is not enough. So uh, put it into another, another term. Uh, rich metadata is needed. So uh, we need to put in uh, as much uh, auxiliary uh, data to the, uh, next to the raw data so that we can interpret. Uh, what was happening uh, during the investigation. Uh, the data needs to be accessible, so uh, we need to use standard tools, standard retrieval methods, and open protocols to, uh, to retrieve the data. Uh, for example, using a simple web browser or log into an FTP site or whatever. Uh, the important thing is that uh, it needs to be uh, widely uh, accessible so that uh, 
no special uh, software installation is needed <clears throat> so that every, everybody can benefit from the from the data that was collected uh, next uh, is interoperable means that uh, uh, the reason behind is that uh, uh, a piece of data in isolation is uh, is very very uh, useful. We need to combine data from different sources. We need to uh, relate data to each other, and this is only possible if the formats are uh, compatible, not necessarily the same, but at least uh, compatible. And the formats are such that uh, the tools that we use every day uh, can uh, recognize them and can use them. So this is again uh, the question of standards. Uh, we, we should use uh, data formats that are standard, uh, standard and uh, can be used by uh, a wide uh, uh, wide group of uh, uh, researchers and users, uh, anybody who is interested in, in the investigation. Uh, it's also important that we uh, create so-called vocabularies, which are uh, uh, special terms for uh, um, a field of investigation, so that these uh, terms which are in these vocabularies can be used in searches uh, and if we want to, uh, for example, look for uh, uh, investigations that involve uh, a specific wave wavelength or energy level or, or a specific uh, substance that was used, then we, we should be able to enter uh, searches that uh, uh, give details about these. And uh, lastly, the data should be reusable. So uh, again, this is a, a topic that comes up very often. Uh, it should be, the, all the rest is just a, a template uh, which needs to be filled in. So it's up to the uh, individual researchers and the people who take part in the investigation to fill in uh, the, uh, the structure. They should uh, take care to uh, provide accurate and relevant content uh, in the data set. Uh, nobody else can, can do this, uh, only, only the uh, people who, who take part in the actual investigation. And of course, uh, they, give, they should give our, um, licenses, which uh, allow other, other people to reuse uh, their data. Of course, <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned, after the uh, embargo period uh, expires, because of course uh, it's the uh, uh, original researchers who, who have the right to, the, who, to use the data first and uh, publish their uh, findings uh, in publications. Uh, two more slides and I'm finished. Uh, uh, there is an European Open Science Cloud, which is uh, uh, planned to, uh, as a community effort, uh, gather all the necessary information uh, about uh, science. This is an ongoing effort and uh, uh, a community effort. And uh, Eli Apps uh, joined uh, uh, with uh, six other partners this effort uh, uh, in the framework of a European project called PANOSC which is the Photon and Neutron Open Science Cloud. And uh, these facilities work together uh, to uh, provide uh, the necessary uh, technical background and, and the necessary uh, services so that these photon and neutron sources uh, uh, will be uh, able to provide uh, data, investigation data to the Open Science Cloud uh, and uh, we at Eli Apps also take part in this effort. You can also find some details about the uh, PANOS project and the uh, project homepage here at panos.eu. Uh, I think i already two minutes uh, behind schedule, so uh, I'm finished. Thank you for your uh, attention. Uh,
I'm sure there will be uh, ways to ask questions if you have any, uh, and I'm ready to answer them. Uh, but with this, I would like to finish my presentation. Thank you for your attention.